Welcome to this presentation, which will cover um, Chapter 10. And as you know, the title for Chapter 10 is Your Responsibilities as a Hospitality Operator to Your Guests. So what obligations, what responsibilities do you have to your guests in your role as a hospitality operator? Let's begin. So we're going to divide up the topics in this chapter into five discrete units. One is we're going to talk about accommodating guests. Then we're going to talk about the privacy issues of guests. We'll talk a little bit about how we're going to maintain our facility um, and also what our responsibilities are to people who are present in our facility but who don't qualify as guests. And finally, we'll talk about the rather awkward situation in which we need to remove somebody who actually is a guest in our facility. So let's get started. Um, going to go over and skip over the, uh, the that topic and jump right into an important topic naturally which is who's a guest who qualifies for the protections that we're going to talk about that guests um, uh, receive and here's a definition from our textbook a guest is a customer who lawfully uses a facility's food beverage lodging and entertainment services this is a little bit odd because when you and I use guests in everyday conversations, we're not talking about a commercial transaction. In fact, we probably exempt commercial transactions from what we're talking about. A guest is a social relationship where somebody is going to receive you know, free stuff at our home. If we invite someone to be a guest in our house, we say we're going to cover the tab. If we're at a restaurant and... Um, uh, we're having dinner with Bob and Bob grabs for the bill. We say, oh, no, you're my guest, meaning we don't want you to pay. I'm going to pay instead. But, of course, when we're talking about a bar or a restaurant or a hotel's definition of guest, we're talking about a fundamentally different thing. We're talking about somebody who does have an economic relationship with us. And so a better word might be a consumer or a customer um, but for whatever reason the term guest seems more gracious perhaps and so we typically use the term guest but it's important to remember that we are talking about an economic relationship we can divide up the term guest into two other categories and one would be a transient guest and again when we see the word transient we're thinking short term um, somebody who is just going to be in a particular place for a brief period of time. And we're going to contrast the idea of a transient guest with a tenant. And this is someone, obviously, who's going to be present for quite a while longer. We usually think about transient guests being people who are staying at a hotel, whereas tenants we think of as people who are staying in an apartment. But that's not necessarily the case. There are people who stay on a very long-term basis in hotels. Um, and so uh, we, we could have um, somebody who is a tenant even though they are not staying in an apartment situation. So let's look at the official definition of transient. A customer, oh, transient guest, is a customer who rents real property for a relatively short period of time. And again, the, the relatively short period of time is further explained by this parenthetical, a small number of days with no intent of establishing a permanent residency. And again, that's what we think of when we think about a hotel. We think about somebody who has a home somewhere else, but who needs to be in a different city for some period of time, and they've chosen a hotel to, to meet that need. And you may be saying, well, why do we care? Why do we care whether somebody's a transient guest or a tenant? We care because there are somewhat different legal uh, requirements when we're dealing with a transient guest compared to a tenant. Uh, many of these differences relate to eviction law, although, as you'll see, um, uh, when the assignment for this chapter deals with a different scenario. But if, um, most states, including Texas, has um, eviction laws that provide a lot of protections to tenants. If I'm renting an apartment and I'm late on my rent by a few days, uh, my landlord isn't going to be able to evict me. He's going to or she's going to have to follow a process to get me evicted, and it's going to take some time. Um, and so uh, we think of that about that being a situation we want to protect that tenant um, more so than the transient guest because again the transient guest has a home somewhere else has a place where he or she is keeping um, his or her possession someplace else so being 
evicted, and I'm using the term eviction, really shouldn't be that term, but, but being forced out of one's hotel room isn't a, a traumatic event. You just move on to a different place. And so there's less protections in that scenario. But as we said, it's not always the case that everybody who's spending the night in a hotel qualifies as a transient guest. And so sometimes it can be the case that in a part, they see me that a hotel can have some people that qualify as tenants. And so therefore all those eviction laws as well as other laws can apply. So let's look at the definition of a tenant. Anyone, including a corporation who rents real property for an extended period of time. So now we're saying extended with the intent of establishing a permanent occupation or residency. This isn't just a brief period of time. This is where this person is going to reside for some period of time. Now, it would be lovely if there was a magic equation we could apply and that we'd be able to have this bright line test. And if you um, failed the test, you were a transient guest. And if you passed the test, you'd be a tenant. And it would be clear to everyone. It'd be clear to the hotel and it would be clear to the guest which side of the line that person is on. Unfortunately, that's not the reality. There are factors that we can consider, but none of these factors are necessarily definitive. They're not necessarily going to resolve this question for all time. Um, and so we'll look at these and we'll consider how they might impact whether a court would find somebody to be a transient guest or a tenant. These factors are important to you as a hospitality manager because as you are uh, dealing with, re uh, with people who might be spending a fairly significant amount of time um, in, your, in your place, that this may help you uh, consider how you want to structure that arrangement so that there is more likely to be a finding of the person being a transient guest. That's usually the preferred treatment that you as a hotel operator want to have. Now again, you don't have complete control of the situation, but it's very likely that your, your uh, visitor or your guest, I will say, um, isn't thinking in those terms at all. And so if you can structure the situation so that you're more likely to fall into this or that guest is more likely to fall in this bucket, that's a win for you. So one thing to consider is how is this person being billed? Are they being billed on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, or a monthly basis? Again, it doesn't mean that they're paying every day, but is it the number of days that is counting is being counted up? So if they stay at your hotel 12 days, they're paying for 12 days. But if you're doing it on a weekly basis, then they're going to pay for two weeks. If they're being billed on a monthly basis, they're going to pay for the whole month. So you might think to yourself, well, gee, I prefer the monthly basis because I'm likely to get more money out of it. Well, that's possibly the case, but the daily basis is going to be more protective for you in terms of this transient guest scenario. Another issue is the tax payment. Are you actually uh, uh, with, uh, having the guest pay the occupancy tax? That's usually a tax that um, the transient guests pay, um, and it's, it's, it's a way for there to be tax revenues for that particular location. Those taxes are typically not paid by tenants who live in a long-term situation because, again, they aren't transient. So they're people in the community, and the, the taxing authorities are less likely to see that they want to um, uh, vigorously or, or aggressively tax those individuals. So you want to see wh whether you are uh, actually requiring the occupancy tax or not. And of course, um, that's not a decision you make. You have to look to see what the circumstances are and whether it's appropriate to uh, 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 incur this tax or not. Address use. Is this person receiving mail here? Is this person using this as a an address for them or that they that they are, you know, uh, getting correspondence, getting packages dropped off. That would be an indication that they are a tenant. If they aren't receiving any type of mail, then they're more likely that there's a transient guest. After all, everybody needs mail, and if they're not getting it at this particular place, they must have some other home that they're getting the, ad, the mail to. And so that would point to the fact that they're really a transient guest here. 
what is the contract that is applicable to this tra uh, transaction? If it's that registration card, the usual tr a way that we um, have guests in, in a hotel have transient guests, and that would be one piece of evidence that would point us towards this particular person being a transient guest. On the other hand, if you're choosing to use a lease in these circumstances, then that person is looking more and more like a tenant. Now in this situation, especially when you're dealing with a um, long-staying uh, person who you have perhaps negotiated a, a uh, set fee with his or her employer, you may find that they want to have a leasing situation or some a mechanism like that, and they may want to have this kind of monthly arrangement. And so, of course, then you'll want to balance. Well, you know, we, we, we like this arrangement. We don't want them to shop and go to another uh, hotel chain but it may be more advantageous for us to have that person as a transient guest. But again, it's not awful if they're a tenant. There's just going to be somewhat more liability, somewhat less um, ability to maneuver, perhaps. Is there an, a deposit? A deposit would again point more toward the tenant scenario. Um, usually you don't request a deposit from your transient guests. Length of the stay is not a, a bright line, but generally speaking, stays under 30 days are looking like a transient guest, and stays over 30 days are looking more like a tenant. Again, we have to look at the complete picture of things, but that's uh, an important uh, element to that analysis. Let's consider the idea of public accommodations. Um, Hospitality businesses are public accommodations. Here's the definition. It's a facility that provides entertainment, room, space, or seating for the use and benefit of the general public. And I guess eating would be another category. Um, hotels and restaurants are public accommodation facilities. Um, they can't discriminate based upon things like race, color, religion, sex, national origin. You may notice these are the same categories that we have uh, with respect to employment discrimination. So we can't deny, we can't say, um, not that you'd want to, but we can't say, oh, we don't want people of that religion or that race or that gender to be present. Um, or to be staying or to be our guests in this particular situation. Um, and we want to be careful that our actions can't be misinterpreted uh, to suggest that that's, that's what we want to do. There's a related term, that's the term segregation. It's a pretty ugly term, it's a historic term obviously. Uh, once upon a time in certain parts of our country, as you know, we were segregated. We, we didn't allow certain uh, groups of people to um, enjoy the same um, uh, options of, of restaurants and public accommodations and hotels that other members of the community were permitted to enjoy. Even our schools were oftentimes segregated. Um, that's the idea behind segregation and of course it's unlawful. Um, we can't segregate on the basis of race or color or religion or national origin. Now, historically, there were some exceptions to this, and this is that private club idea. Um, there have been golf, golf courses who have done this. I think the Augusta the golf course um, was one that uh, d designated itself as a private club, and with that designation, it and others, I don't, uh, I don't exactly know the categories. I think they excluded women, but some of these clubs historically excluded people of certain religions certain races and certain genders saying well you know we, we are a private club you have to be a member to use our facility so we're not a public accommodation we're a voluntary association more so um, courts are less inclined to be persuaded that uh, businesses that that are in the hospitality industry are public or private clubs um, I'm not going to say it's impossible to make that argument but it's going to be a rare business that's going to be successful in making that argument and certainly the vast majority of hotels and restaurants and bars will not be able to make that argument at all and so they have to be welcoming to all the different um, groups of, of individuals who might want to use the facility so um, we know we can't deny people access because of their race or their religion or their gender or um, their national origin. Let's look at some ways that we might be able to deny admission to folks. 
of course, the, the, the first thing that we want, to, we want to say is that obviously we're in the business of admitting people and providing services to them. That's how we make our business. That's how we make money. And, and so we, we, our, our default setting is, yeah, come on in, right? That's what we want to say. But circumstances can come up that that isn't what we, we want to do. Uh, one situation, unfortunately, that comes up is uh, the individual can't pay. Uh, maybe they have ordered services and we don't think they can pay, or maybe they've actually received the services and are now telling us they can't pay. Um, certainly that is a basis to deny someone admission or deny someone continuing admission to the place. Um, if that comes up, um, or one thing that sometimes comes up is, well, um, it, sometimes people might say, well, we need to have evidence that you can pay before you actually partake in this. And it might be, for example, a credit card uh, that, that you, uh, when somebody registers in your hotel, you, you get a credit card information so that you can a bill. Uh, they can't just run out on, on the bill, so to speak. Um, if you have such a policy, those policies are generally lawful, but you have to apply them consistently. You can't say, well, um, people of this religion or people that we think are of this race or people that are of this um, national origin, we're going to uh, assume that they can't pay for this service but other people were going to assume that they can. Um, that's not a good idea. Now you might say, well, let's say someone comes in, their clothes are tattered, they don't have any luggage, they don't smell good, their uh, hygiene is not, um, your personal hygiene isn't, isn't good, um, and they request a room, well, you might say, well, there are reasons for us to suspect this person lacks the means to pay for our hotel room, whereas another person, perhaps of the same race or gender or religion, um, who presents himself or herself in a different way, we would welcome. Um, it, it's, it's a best practice, though, to have a consistent policy across the board because that person who is checking in the guests, um, we don't want to give him or her a lot of leeway um, because they may either consciously or unconsciously make some assumptions. For example, um, a uh, uh, unkempt uh, Caucasian person they might assume was just out on the town having a good time, um, maybe going out to a sporting event or something, and that's why they're unkempt. But that person might assume an African-American who's unkempt, perhaps that person's at homeless or something like that. And so it, it's a best practice to have a consistent policy that the, uh, the staff knows how to apply that doesn't permit unconscious prejudices and, and uh, preconceived notions to impact how services are delivered. Um, so that's one category. If you can't pay, you don't, ha you don't have the right to stay. Another is a person has a readily communicable disease. Fortunately, this doesn't come up a lot. Um, any people who have these types of diseases usually don't communicate they have these types of diseases. Um, uh, but that can be a category. Now, of course, um, many diseases are not, even though they may have a stigma associated with them, are not necessarily readily communicable. For example, AIDS or HIV is not readily uh, is not easily contagious. And so you can't deny accommodations uh, to individuals who have uh, that particular disease. Um, also, hepatitis C would be another example of that. Now, um, it's possible that there may need to be some, is there may, issues may arise when you have a worker, especially in the kitchen, um, who has those kinds of conditions. Um, and so that uh, is worthy of some additional reflection, but a guest who has those those circumstances, um, unless it is a truly a readily, readily communicable disease, um, there's no reason to deny admission. Um, let's say an individual wishes to enter the facility with an item that is prohibited. Uh, an example that might come up here would be handguns. As you know, in Texas, we have um, concealed carry and open carry and individuals who are licensed for either or for both have the opportunity to carry their um, handguns um, generally where they wish although there are certain places they can't take them and one of the things that the hotel or the restaurant or the bar needs to decide is do we want to welcome those customers with their handguns into um, our businesses? 
And so um, there's an assignment on that issue. Uh, please read the article uh, that is attached to that assignment with the ins and outs of Texas law. Um, but if somebody, let's say your particular facility decides not to permit individuals uh, with, a, with a handgun into the facility and you, you dot the I's and cross the T's and do what you need to, and the person st uh, is insisting upon coming into the facility, well, that is um, uh, a, a category that, that you could uh, consider denying admission to that guest under those circumstances. When a guest is intoxicated, that can be a reason to exclude them from entering or to ask them to leave. Again, you want to be sure that um, you are consistent in how you apply that policy, that you don't, you're not more strict with one category versus another category of individuals. And obviously, you don't want to overserve your guests in your facility because, again, that's a dram shop act issue that can arise so you want to be careful to train your bartenders and your wait staff not to overserve. but sometimes people show up in an already in an intoxicated condition or they're intoxicated with something other than alcohol and under those circumstances yes you uh, uh, certainly can deny them admission uh, sometimes an individual might present a threat either because of the way they talk or their body language or perhaps they have actually done something violent under those circumstances you can obviously um, remove them from the facility um, again you want to be consistent and not uh, make assumptions well that person because of his or her race or or religion or something is more likely to be a danger uh, than other individuals if the individual doesn't seek to become a guest but is just loitering or something along those lines then you can uh, say hey you aren't welcome to continue here and then they become a trespasser and then you can um, have them leave if they don't leave on their own the individual may also be too young to be present this is especially relevant in the bar situation where you uh, logically don't want people under the age of 18 excuse me under 21 uh, because uh, you don't want to have to constantly card the individuals um, and so it makes sense to exclude uh, people who aren't eligible to uh, have alcoholic beverages. Now there can be other times, for example, you might not want to allow people to rent hotel rooms if they're under uh, a certain age, uh, perhaps because uh, they have the ability to disaffirm the contract or something along those lines. Um, but generally it's going to be in the bar situation and you certainly can exclude under those circumstances. You need to be consistent though. For example, you can't allow uh, young ladies under the age of 21 to be present, but but um, not allow young men under the age of 21 to be present. A fifth category is if the facility is full. If um, there's a particularly a fire code issue, then yes, you can say, oh, we're full, we can't allow any more in. Um, and again, you have to be consistent. You can't decide, ah, you know, uh, our next patrons would be people that we would prefer not to admit, so we're gonna say we're full. Um, we, we, you need to make sure that you're actually uh, full and that the reason that you're denying admission is because uh, this the place is full. So we have finished the first topic in this chapter, accommodating guests, and, and we will go on and talk about guest privacy in the next chapter. Um, as always, if you have questions about uh, the materials that we cover, please reach out to me, contact me, oh, sorry, um, email me with questions or stop by my office hours to discuss the material in uh, more detail. I thank you for your attention and I hope that you have a wonderful day.